My name is Art Saborio, and I'm the director and producer of A Series of Witches. In episode one, New Orleans, we'll get into the deep historical past of magic and witches. We'll talk about Marie Laveau, called both the most powerful witch and voodoo queen to ever grace the city. As of today, she's still feared and well respected. Then I'll introduce you to Mimi Curry, a modern day New Orleans witch. Now let's begin our journey. Follow me to the state of Louisiana and to New Orleans to join me in the search for the modern day witch. Through my travels throughout the US and internationally, I learned that there's beauty in every culture, race, religion, and non-religion. Those you meet in our series are the same people standing next to you at the grocery checkout, pick up their kids at the same school your kids go to, and patiently stop behind you in your car as you wait for the light to change from red to green. You may even see them handing out food to those in need and donating their time and money to the less fortunate. Now before we talk about the present, we need to know about the past, and New Orleans has a sordid and colorful past full of vampires, ghosts, witches, and lore. It's not uncommon to walk down a dark alley late at night and come upon an attractive person who seems to want to strike up a conversation with you, only to dissipate into nothingness right in front of your eyes. Or to have the feeling of something or someone watching or pursuing you as you hurry home from a late night gathering. Trevor Board would be our guide through New Orleans' rich past of voodoo and witches. Trevor was born and raised in Louisiana, fluent in English and French, and he spent most of his life living in and among the New Orleans lifestyle. The city of New Orleans was founded in early 1718 by the French as La Nouvelle Orleans under Louisiana Governor Jean-Baptiste Lemoyne de Bienville. Shortly thereafter, the French colonist population increased, but the amount of funding did not and the colonists were left destitute. The ability to improve people's livelihoods was limited and only available to the affluent families of the community. Four years after the city's establishment, in 1722, the first recorded hurricane struck the city. Every building in the city was destroyed, which led to a new way of city planning called the Grid Plan. You can still see this ingenious building plan in the French Quarter. Louisiana changed hands a few times from France in 1763 to Spain and then back again to the French in 1802. In 1803, Napoleon sold Louisiana to the United States in the Louisiana Purchase. Over 150 years have passed since Marie Laveau left this earthly plane, yet people still believe she has the power over the city of New Orleans. Born on September 10, 1801 in New Orleans, Marie Catherine Laveau was a Louisiana practitioner of voodoo, an herbalist, and a midwife. Because of her prowess in the realm of voodoo, she was nicknamed the Voodoo Queen. She was, and still is considered, one of the most powerful witches ever to grace the city. Many years would pass before a new generation of witches would begin to fill the void left by Mrs. Laveau. Marie Laveau was born a free woman of color. She married in 1819 to Jacques Paris and later had two children. After the first husband's passing, she later entered a domestic partnership with a nobleman of French descent and reportedly had another 15 children. Although Marie was a devoted Catholic, 
She also mixed the voodoo into her prayers in daily life. She would attend Catholic Mass in both mornings and evenings, and she frequented Congo Square for voodoo ceremonies on Sunday afternoons. In Congo Square, Marie gained extensive knowledge of voodoo from a man named Dr. John. He also taught her how to craft powerful magic through a charm called Grigri. Marie started to create Grigri bags and sold them out of her home to patrons in search of protection, luck or any other intentions her clients needed. Marie's life and legend drastically changed through the selling of her Grigri bags. People were receiving magical results from her voodoo conjurings. Day by day, Marie's legend was growing. Soon, she would be called the voodoo queen. Marie built up a robust network of political, aristocratic, and religious connections. Her associations ran so deep that she was allowed to conduct voodoo ceremonies on the altar of the most revered Catholic church in Louisiana. Her powers would later be put to test in the 1930s when a wealthy man's son was on trial for murder. After trying everything to help his son avoid the consequences of his actions, the father called on Marie and offered her a house if she could free his son through the use of voodoo. Marie accepted and began preparing. Legend has it Marie spent the week praying at the Catholic church and torturing herself by holding scorching guinea peppers in her mouth for hours. In voodoo, the spirits hear and come to those who endure great pain. On the day of the court hearing, she placed the hot guinea peppers under the judge's chair. People believed these special voodoo guinea peppers gave Marie control over the judge and set the man's son free. The father made good on his promise and gave Marie a house on St. Anne Street. Marie died in her home on June 16, 1881. She was 86 years old. Her body was laid to rest in St. Louis Cemetery No. 1 in the Widow Paris Crypt. New Orleans is well known for its vampires, but it's also known for its witches. Now we'll go deep into New Orleans and introduce you to a modern day witch and uncover some of New Orleans' original dark magical secrets. Among the dark alleyways and hideaways, through the historic French Quarter's eclectic Lord Decatur, nestled among local bars, antique shops, gothic clothiers, vintage boutiques, head shops, collectible emporiums, jazz clubs, creole cookeries, and cozy cafes lies an authentic old world witchery called Hex New Orleans. Mimi Curry, a powerful witch who is well versed in her craft, conducts readings for the not-so-shy tourists and locals. I currently live in Slidell, Louisiana, which is about 30 minutes outside of New Orleans. I have lived here for almost three years. You know, what keeps me here is I do have a uh, job where I work at Hex Old Road Witchery, which is in downtown New Orleans doing psychic work, but I also have my own business as well, um, which is the Sea Witch Emporium. So, you know, with New Orleans being the magical, beautiful place that it is, it's, it feels like home here. I do have a son and I love him to pieces. His name is Tristan and I do a lot of things um, with him in mind, um, especially like these little spiritual practices that I have, especially whenever it's around the holidays like it is right now. Um, you know, we would make decorations or you know, I would pull out old family recipes and things like that. And I think it was like very important to kind of like instill that in your children because you need to know where you came from. Um, but the other part, I guess, is, you know, it might sound corny, but I do feel like I'm here for a higher purpose more so than I am here to just pay taxes and die and that's it. <laughs> so I, I, you know, I'm here to help others, but I'm also here to kind of like show people, you know, this is just one aspect of the several different aspects of this path that you're on. So, but you know, I, I have good friends. I love my family. I love, I love my city. It's fantastic. <laughs> I 
grew up in North Carolina originally. And um, when I was younger, I would help my grandmother out with a lot of different things. And they were farmers, so they planted things by the moon. Things were very seasonal. Everything had a rhyme and a reason. There was a lot of talk about ancestral stuff. But as far as like the spiritual part of it, I didn't really notice my gifts until I was like three or four because I would see what I now know as ghosts. <laughs> they thought it was imaginary friends, but no, it's not. <laughs> and that's when I found out that I was a psychic. Because <laughs> this is something that actually runs in my family. My aunt is a medium. My mom also has spiritual guests as well. Um, my grandmother also had her own spiritual gifts. It's just that hers were a little bit different than my mom's side of the family. I only see certain things if they're like really really strong um because most spirits don't have the ability to kind of like show themselves as much as like you know say hollywood makes it seem like it, it is but um i do hear a lot of things i will get a lot of smells from stuff um i will have dreams of things um sometimes i'll see shadows kind of darting about from place to place so it's just kind of like i have a gamut of stuff and i'm like okay and this is the life of a witch <laughs> Ever since I was able to hold a crayon, I have been doodling and drawing and painting and everything. I've had my art displayed in several different uh, art shows from elementary school all the way up till now. And it's one of those, it's a part of me that it's a form of self-expression. And I do put a lot of my spiritual nature into my paintings too, because it's letting that voice be heard and I do also make products as well and I'm fairly empathic whenever I do readings and I'm doing spells for people and that sort of thing so I just kind of like it's almost like channeling in, an, in a sense to where I can take that energy and I can transmute it into something um, when I'm making art or if I'm making products or if I'm doing a bath or if I'm doing um, a floor wash. It's almost like my ancestors, um, the deities that I work with, the Orishas that I work with, all of that is working through me to make something happen. And I think it's really important to not cut that part of you off when you do practice because a lot of people are like, oh, that's not what a witch does. I'm like, there's no right answer <laughs> to being a witch. You can do whatever you want. If you want to look like Nancy from the craft, cool. If you want to have a cottage core aspect to it cool just you do you <laughs> so with growing up in North Carolina and also finding out what my heritage is which is predominantly uh, German as well as a pretty good amount of Scandinavian I grew up what now would be considered um, German folk magic. It did have a very heavy sprinkling of Jesus because, you know, my grandmother was Baptist and I grew up that way. However, um, over the years, I tried to kind of like find that perfect fit for me. So I do practice German folk magic, which is also like considered Southern folk magic because it's here in the United States. But I also am a practitioner of Ifa, which is an African traditional religion that comes out of Nigeria. And that is like a completely whole different set of things. So it's a combination of the two. I do believe there are people that are gifted and I think everybody is gifted in their own way and everybody's spiritualism is unique to them. I know lots of people who are Christian but are very, very witchy <laughs> and I know a lot of people that are like the complete opposite and it's more of like an aesthetic thing. But, you know, for me, um, being a witch is more about 
following what those gifts that I was given, you know, using them for good use, actually helping others and connecting with people within my community. With IFA, IFA is about community. It is about helping your fellow man and making sure that other people are taken care of. I have a really nice support system within my spiritual family in that aspect. Um, I will, you know, help anybody out if they're in a bind. I'm a very giving person. So if somebody like say needs a ride or if, you know, they are having some issues, I will use my skills that I have to kind of like help them out, you know, much kind, of, much like um, somebody who's in like a prayer circle, you know, they give their condolences and they help people out and they have your back. It's the same thing, you know, with being in IFA, you know, you have that ability to do that. But also it's about those everyday little things. Um, like, I'm, I'm a pretty generous person. I donate uh, clothes. I've um, worked in soup kitchens. I've done a lot of different things to help other people out. And I always try to be super understanding of a person's situation because even though, no, I've never been hooked on drugs or alcohol or anything like that, I can still relate to these people and let them know. It's like, hey, you know, it doesn't have to be this way. <laughs> we can do things a little bit differently, so. I'm one of those rare people that spirits love me and a lot of times because they love me they want to work with me but i do personally know better um i work with who i work with because they came to me and i did my research and i went to people who knew more than me at the time so i could know how to work with these things in a respectful manner and i think this is really important because a lot of people are like oh you're an atr you don't understand these things because you're not a person of color and the thing is is Eva is a very accepting religion it doesn't matter what color you are or where you came from or what you've been through in life they will accept you as long as you are being respectful and you are going through an actual Ia or Baba or somebody who is initiated into the practice um, so when I first had Oshun come to me. I remember she would, I had like a nice little statue of her sitting on the table. And I just kept hearing this little voice. It's like, you need to get initiated. You need to get initiated. And I was like, well, where, where, who, what am I supposed to do? You bring this person to me. And lo and behold, a year later, I met the right person. So it's kind of one of those things where you know, I do work with the Orishas, I do work with a lot of the old Norse or German pantheon, which is kind of, they kind of commingle. Um, and like, I've had other things come to me, but I don't, I, I'm kind of like, I respect you, I appreciate you, but I'm just not, you're not my people. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna pay your respects and then I'm gonna keep doing what I'm doing. I do have my Orisha beads here. These here are my Ilekes, um, which are actually blessed by my Ia. Each one of these uh, represents a different Orisha, right? And so this, this one's for Ogun, this one's for Shango, this one's for uh, Yumoya. Then I have Ifa here. Obatala, as well as Oshun. What they, they're kind of like these little reminders of, you remember back in the 90s when everybody used to wear the what would Jesus do bracelets? It's kind of like that, but it's the Aoife aspect of it. You wear these to embody and embrace that energy of that particular Risha, to embrace that energy and that power, that protection, so to speak. Um, you're never supposed to um, do drugs or drink alcohol whenever you have these on. You're also not supposed to bathe with them or sleep with them. You can sleep with them if you're very, very sick and your um, Babalao tells you that it's okay, but that's like a very rare case. Um, 
but that's kind of like if you don't do those things if you do those things it's showing disrespect to those particular people so you have to be very mindful whenever you're wearing them i wear them a lot whenever i work or i'm doing readings for people or if i'm doing healing services or whatever because it kind of reminds me i'm like okay i gotta keep my head i gotta be calm i gotta be relaxed <laughs> i don't need to do anything stupid and um i see a lot of people that have these but they're not blessed properly or they just are like oh i just thought they were pretty and they embody this oration i'm like no it's just a necklace unless you go and get it actually properly blessed by a baba lao or an anifa period otherwise it's very disrespectful for you to wear those if you're going to get ilikes blessed it's better to do that in person but everybody is a little bit different some people demand you to be there in person period no matter what and other people are, are a little bit more forgiving it's like look i did here's the blessing this is what i did this is and i'm going to send this to you in the mail that sort of thing but you do um have to clean them every so often so i'll be like i'm gonna go soak these in some gin <laughs> for like a day and get all the funk off and then i'm gonna be good if you want to find me you can find me either on facebook or Instagram at the Sea Witch Emporium. I do answer messages regularly on both of those. Um, so you can either hit me up on there. Um, if you are ever in New Orleans or if you ever get a reading through Hex, you can find me under um, Mimi Curry, which is, um, and I'm here like three days a week just doing readings. And my business and my and readings here are two totally separate things and they don't intersect so you know you can find me a lot of different ways you just met mimi curry a modern day new orleans witch i greatly enjoyed talking with her and hearing about her life and how she blends witchcraft ifa and all the rest like the tides you never know when people can show up in your lives and a lot of times they show up at the right time some will stay for a short period of time others will stay for longer and then there are those which you share a spiritual bond with, and those people stay with you through multiple lifetimes. Take the time to look and listen to those who come into your life. You never know when someone with some very special gifts will pop up in your life at the right time when you need them the most. So when you meet someone, look deep beyond their faces. Strip out the politics, religious affiliations, race and beliefs. Go deep and peer into their hearts and souls. Learn their hopes, fears, wants, needs, and dreams. Because only there will you find common ground, friendship, and understanding. When all is said and done on this planet, all we are is human, and all we have is humanity. This has been my series of witches.